Welcome back, Charleston, to the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show Halloween Special. So today we're talking about horror stories in real estate. We just talked about wire fraud uh, as a scam that's costing people over a billion dollars a year nationwide. So if you're just joining us, you can catch every episode of the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show on our website, listingsincharleston.com. We're also on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify. Uh, you can find our podcast basically anywhere. Uh, but listingsincharleston.com is our website, so you can also learn more about my real estate team and who we are and what we do and what we sell, how we sell it, uh, look at some testimonials, find out how much your home is worth, and then look at some of our incentives uh, that we offer for folks that reach out to us that want to hire us to help them buy, sell, or invest in real estate. So listingsincharleston.com is the website. And, of course, you can always call or text me. My number is 843-400-8009, 843-400-8009. So I'm going to bounce around. I'm going to talk with you guys about some of these stories and things that we experience and I this is probably my favorite show of the year truth be told just because there there really are things that happen uh in real estate that uh agents just don't like to talk about everybody likes you to think that any home that they touch uh sells in a matter of days for 100% of asking price they find some success stories along the way and then they essentially use that to promote themselves as as being the status quo that's the expectation and then, of course, you've got folks when when helping uh, to purchase a home that will, you know, brag about being able to get it for a certain amount off of the asking price, and so on and so forth, and leads you to believe that that's commonplace as well. You know, hey, I just helped this guy get a get a home for twenty percent off of the asking price. Well, it could be that that house was twenty percent overpriced, so you didn't really gain any ground there. But the, the point here is that there are there are all these things that happen in real estate that make for a better real estate agent. You know, it's one of my, my one of my favorite sayings is that a smooth sea never made for a skillful mariner. So when you hire a real estate agent, look for the person that's had enough experience to to be able to get their client through tough times. And you never think it's going to be the you know you would never think that you'd be the person that's going to have a tough time selling your house. We've had situations this year where you know homes are selling in a matter of days in in particular areas, and we'll have the listing, and then two weeks will go by, and then a month will go by, and then six weeks will go by. And everybody's hands are up in the air saying, well, hey, what in the world's going on? Why hasn't this sold yet? And the reality is, the truth of the matter is, is that the average days on market in Charleston is still about six weeks. Yes, we have incredible, we have record low inventory. We have record high demand. Well, I wouldn't say record high demand, but we have extremely high demand, which is what's putting up prices. Um, and so now everybody is hearing these stories from their friends and from real estate agents and things that they see on Facebook or that they hear on the radio and Yes, I, I realize the irony in that. Um, but everybody's kind of of the expectation that, hey, when you put a property in the market, it's sold in a matter of days and you get multiple offers. And yeah, oftentimes that's true, but it's all part of the strategy. You know, when you sit down with your listing agent and you talk through what you hope to accomplish, there should be a tried and true method for accomplishing that goal. And that's a conversation that needs to be had. And that you as the seller, you need to trust your gut and you need to verify that what that agent's telling you is something that can actually produce results. So let's use a few examples here. You know, I had an agent on my team that had a property under contract. It's an investment property for for one of his investors. They're buying a property to renovate, flip. And when they got the appraisal, they're they're getting private money um, like most investors do, right? They don't go to traditional banks. They find somebody that can be their, their private money lender, uh, that they either, you know, they pay a percentage, um, at closing and then they pay them monthly payments. Sometimes investors will just cut in, uh, the person financing the deal at a percentage. There's a few different ways to, uh, slice that cake. But in this instance, the borrower who was getting, uh, private money, uh, agreed to just pay some money up front. Uh, both to the person providing the loan and then in the form of a down payment so that they were invested in the deal. Obviously, after the first month, payments would begin and it requires an appraisal. So the appraisal comes in. The appraisal is $250,000 lower than the contract amount, which in this scenario was about 40% below fair market value. And so... When you do an appraisal like this, we're also looking at, well, hey, what's it worth once all the 
uh, renovations have been completed. You know, what's the profit here? We know the purchase price. We know the closing costs and all the finance charges associated with the purchase. How much is it going to cost to renovate it? And when it's all said and done, is there enough profit for the private money lender to say, yes, I feel comfortable giving you that amount of money because I know there's enough profit there to where it's going to be really tough for me to lose my investment, my investment meaning the loan, the amount that that lender is providing to that contractor, to that investor. So this appraisal comes in. It's $250,000 below where it should be. It's, it, it's just it's wrong on so many levels. They, they're using neighborhoods that are not comparable. They're using properties in neighborhoods that are significantly smaller, not clearly or not, not even close to being as, as nice. Um, there's, just, there's just stuff all over the place on this appraisal. And I see them every once in a while where it's like, how in the world does this person have the ability to do appraisals for a living? And so I sit down with my agent and we start picking this thing apart. We're saying, well, that's not a comp. That's not a comp. This is a better comp. We're looking at the individual adjustments that the appraiser is making for the comparables that they chose. And the, the adjustments are way off. They don't make sense. They're not uniform throughout the appraisal. And this is, you know, I have a lot of experience in doing this, especially over the past few years, because prices have been going up significantly. I mean, there are plenty of areas in Charleston where we're seeing a 10% increase in pricing just this year. Who would have thought that, by the way? Uh, and so, yes, appraisers are having a tough time keeping up. Um, in many instances, buyers are willing to pay more than, frankly, the average sales price of the comparable homes that sold six months ago. Because if, if you really think about it, in a market where prices are going up, when the property hits the market, that agent and that seller are looking at sales from the previous six months. Sometimes they have to go back a year in areas where there just aren't a lot of sales. But typically speaking, they're looking at things that have sold over the past six months. Well, in some areas, there could have been a, a you know several percentage points uh, that would have needed to be applied in the form of appreciation to a house if, let's say, it closed in May and we're looking at comps for a property that's going to list in November. But here's here's where it gets even more complicated or just things that agents need to be aware of. And this, I'm going to talk about this for just a second, then I'll move on to some more horror stories. But, you know, it's important when it comes to pricing properties because I see people um, missing the mark on pricing. And that's just natural. That just naturally happens when there are essentially two real estate agents for every property available for sale. We've got about a little over 3,000 homes available for sale and 7,000 agents in our market. So it's it's easy to understand and wrap your head around the fact that because inventory is so low and because listing opportunities are so hard to come by for a lot of agents that when they get that opportunity to represent a seller, which is a lead source for them because people call on the sign, maybe they, you know, inquire online. And even if that home doesn't sell, well, hopefully they can sell a buyer that inquired on that property, something else. So when somebody gets a listing, uh, they leverage that, and they should, quite frankly, because that's a function of marketing, uh, and you want everybody contacting you about that property, and that's a good thing, but not when uh, the agent knows that there's, frankly, just no chance of the house selling at that price, and they're not being forthcoming with you about it. And so, you know, back to this example of this appraisal that came in way low, we contested it. And the appraiser rose the appraised value by $200,000. About, you know, what, 30-something percent. That's a significant amount of money. Had we not known how to do that, had we not been able to justify our price and know about the appraisal process, then our client would have more than likely lost that deal, which, by the way, is on the market now after a beautiful renovation And he's going to make a lot of money on that deal. But we almost didn't get it because we couldn't finance it. And the seller wasn't going to wait around for some investor to try and figure out alternative financing. Which is a, you know, that's a big deal for a lot of investors. It's hard to find the deals right now. And when you do find them, you have to be the type of investor that can close no matter what. There shouldn't be any hiccups uh, to you being able to deliver on your promise of a smooth closing. Which is what a lot of sellers want when they sell to an investor. They don't want the headache. They don't want to bicker over repairs. They realize they're taking a bit of a haircut on the deal, but they just want out. They want their money and they want it easily. And so 
these appraisals that we're that we're seeing sometimes, yes, they need to be um, adjusted. There are there is information either missing from the appraisal or inaccurate in the appraisal, and that's why you you know you folks that have good reputations in town are going to have better success at contesting these appraisals uh, rather than kind of getting that typical hot headed real estate agent that's uh, going to just put everybody on blast and you know start name calling, start shouting. Uh, it's really counterproductive. And frankly, those people are a pain in the you-know-what to work with. Nobody likes working with a person like that. So we take them through this process of how to contest the appraisal. And I'll tell you, I had another deal where uh, that first deal actually fell through because the appraiser, even after all of the information that I submitted, I set a a two-page, you know, single-spaced document saying, these are all the things that I see in this appraisal. These are comps that weren't used that are more comparable. Um, these adjustments don't seem to be in line. There's no consistency in the amount that you're giving for adjustments. You haven't adjusted for lot size, which is a big deal. All these things. And the appraiser uh, increased the appraisal amount by $10,000, which was still not even not even close. Uh, the entire appraisal was a joke. And so after we tried to contest it and that failed, then you can move to have that appraisal get rejected. You can try and throw it out and prove to essentially the lender that, hey, this appraiser is, you know, they're just not familiar with pricing and and value in this area. We've got a contract for, you know, 30, I think it was $30,000 more than the increased appraisal. But ultimately, the lender uh, decided not to reject the appraisal uh, and we had to sell it to somebody else. And we did and we got the job done, but it was a frustration that the seller shouldn't have to deal with. And frankly, the buyer really wanted the house, but they couldn't afford to pay the difference between the un- increased appraisal amount and the contract amount. It was like 30 something thousand dollars, which when that happens, by the way, the buyer has to come to the table with cash because they're only going to base your loan and your down payment off of the appraisal amount. So any difference between the appraisal amount and the contract amount has to be made up in the form of cash from the buyer. And that's why you see appraisal contingencies on contracts. Because if a buyer does not have that and an appraisal comes in low, they don't have the cash to be able to bridge the gap, then they're in default of contract. Now, when an appraisal comes in low, the seller doesn't have to accept that lower amount, just like the buyer doesn't have to pay the contract amount. It's a new point of negotiation. Um, But we're seeing it more and more, and that's just a, a, a function of prices going up really across the board in Charleston and data lacking, you know, the, the data that they use for those appraisers, you have to uh, assign appreciation to those numbers. You know, if something sold six months ago, it was under contract two months prior to that, which is what they based the offer amount on. Uh, and at the time that they made the offer, they were looking at comparable sales six months prior to that. So if you're tracking here, what I'm saying is that when somebody is trying to determine fair market value right now for a house and they look at something that sold six months ago, which was under contract two months before that, that date is already eight months old. But at the point in time that they made the offer eight months ago, they were looking at homes that had sold six months ago. So now we're looking at data that's 12 to 14 months old and you can't use what happened last year and apply it to a home this year. You have to assign appreciation. And if you don't know what's happening in the market and you don't have, you know, the, the experience to understand what people are willing to pay and how to justify value, then a lot of people are getting caught between a rock and a hard place. So if you're thinking about selling, uh, you know, the first thing, look at all the homes that are not available for sale right now. When we go on listing appointments, we're looking at things that are on the market under contract and that have sold in the past six months. In most instances, there's like one or two other homes available for sale. So there's an incredible opportunity for sellers right now, even right now, even this time of year, because inventory is so low, to really be the seller that kind of sets the bar for pricing. 